to be with you today. Um, when, you, when you've been away from a church for a while and been remembered by the orangutans, we had a change of pastor in our church uh, back in Seven Oaks, and, uh, and he said we didn't look like the orangutans at all, so <laughs> he was a bit disappointed. Uh, let's just pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can open it and share it one with another. We thank you it's been translated into a language we can understand and speak. Pray that we would apply it to our hearts and apply it to our daily living. In Jesus' name, amen. Just by way of introduction, um, following a lead from John earlier on, uh, my wife and I went out to Indonesia back in 1985, and uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, we were based in York at that time. I would got a job, a uh, boyhood amb ambition to work in a sweet factory. I would got a job at Roundtrees in York, and um, I'm a psychologist, so I was working on the recruitment team, uh, helping to go around universities and colleges and so on, recruiting folk for, for Roundtrees. And um, then we went to Bible College. Um, Eleanor is a teacher. She's a primary school teacher. And at Bible College, uh, we had our twins. We took twins with us and then later on went out to Indonesia and had two more children. So we have three girls and one boy. They're all grown up now um, and uh, all through university and on into jobs, though I'm not entirely sure they launched, if you see what I mean. It seems to take longer to launch children these days than we thought. Um, and out uh, of those 29 years or so in OMF, we have been uh, known to you guys for, we think, more than 20 years. So thank you so much for your support and um, coming behind us in many, many, many ways. So it's nice to be back amongst friends. We worked in Indonesia for many years, and our children went to school in Chifu School in uh, Malaysia. And after a number of years, uh, Ellie and I worked at that school uh, on the dorm parenting and teaching side. And then I was brought back here with Ellie uh, for the personnel work, recruiting and sending out missionaries for OMF. So I became director for personnel for 10 years, from 2000 to 2010. Uh, as, as they do, the children grew up, and we came to that phase in life where we could go back to Asia, we went back to Malaysia, and we've been serving since 2011 at the Sabah Theological Seminary in East Malaysia. So um, it's the same language group as, as Indonesia. So we can still speak, actually most of Borneo where we're working is Indonesia. And the Malaysian church uses the Indonesian Bible. So we can speak Malay and we teach in Malay and in English. I'm head of counseling, um, which means I teach things like pastoral counseling and the marriage course and various other things. And Ellie, my wife, is head of English. Uh, she would very quickly say, if she was here, um, that there is no one else to be head of. She is English. Um, so she teaches uh, theological English and tries to help the students who need um, English because most of the books uh, that they need to study in are in English. And we have many English congregations as well, many visitors, so our students need English. So between us, we both serve the Sabbath Theological Seminary, which prepares pastors for service in the Anglican Church, Methodist, Lutheran, uh, and Presbyterian churches around where we are and beyond. We do have a few students from Korea and Myanmar, various other countries, but mostly they're local Malaysians. So today, we're going to look at Jonah, uh, first couple of chapters this morning, and we'll look at the second, the final two chapters this, this evening, having a look to see what we can discover about uh, God's heart for the nations in the book of Jonah. The first thing to notice is that God is in control. We'll see that. There is a bit early on in the book which says, um, what are you up to in effect, or what are you doing? Can you, can you explain? So let's just quickly ask that. What have you done, it says early on. Jonah is asked that question. So have you ever been asked, what have you done? I was when I bought a massive amount of carrots by mistake by my mother. I was given pocket money when I was very young and sent off to buy just a few carrots to eat. And uh, I made the mistake of giving pocket money to the greengrocer. 
And in those days, they were very, very cheap. And he didn't say, how many do you want? He simply said, do you want two shillings, or 10p now, but do you want two shillings worth of carrots? They were tuppence a pound, so I got 12 pounds, more than five kilograms of carrots to carry home. Um, what have you done? The question that you'll find in Jonah when we get to it. Um, have you put diesel petrol in the office car, which only takes unleaded? What have you done? Um, have you washed the Aaron sweater that your mother knitted for you on the wrong program and it's come out the wrong size? I've done that as well. Or if you perhaps more recently, slightly more seriously, the, the, the Prime Minister of Korea is asking, you know, what has his government done? Have they done enough? Because of this terrible tragedy they've got with the, the sunk ferry and all of the children that have died. And he's offered his resignation because so many Koreans are saying, what have you done? So that is an interesting, we'll come to that. We'll come to that question. It seems uh, the first day of Jonah's job, at the end of it, or at least sort of halfway through, somebody is screaming, kind of, what are you up to? It's an interesting point to, to arrive at. So what exactly is prophecy? Before we start, Jonah is a prophetic book. Prophecy is talking about the covenant between God and man, God and Israel, God and, and the nations. If you will do what God wants you to do, there will be blessing. If you will not, if you're disobedient, there will be punishment. That's the solid theme throughout prophecy. And in this particular situation, we are seeing political, military, economic upheaval. So within a very short time, this whole area of the Middle East will change. So Jonah is speaking into that. Um, we can see populations changing and shifting. Uh, we see the international powers changing, borders moving. So uh, very much like our modern world, uh, where we used to know that America and Russia were the superpowers, but now if you wander around Africa and the Middle East and various other places, you discover China is pretty much the up-and-coming superpower. So the balance of power in the world is changing today. Religious affiliation is changing. Um, political, military, social, economic upheaval is all around us. We've just gone through um, the economic crisis, which is still being felt terribly in countries like Spain and Greece. And a few years before that, the Southeast Asian economic crisis. And that's being felt still um, in, in the problems of Indonesia and other countries. So Jonah speaks and could speak to our time as well. But again, before we start, we should note that Jonah's a little bit different to other books. Most books of prophecy kick off with, here we go, for the words of the Lord spoken through the prophet. And we can understand from the way that the prophet speaks and prophesies more about God and how God wants us to behave or how God or what God will do, all sorts of other aspects of prophecy. But Jonah is not exactly like that. In Jonah, God is doing the speaking. God is the protagonist, if you like. So what happens to Jonah is part of the story for us to study. It's not just the words of Jonah. In fact, there's very little in terms of the words of Jonah. But there's an awful lot about the protagonist. We can see that God calls Jonah. We'll see that. We'll go through it slowly. We also see that um, when Jonah doesn't obey, God sends a storm. And we can learn about that. We can learn about the power of God in that. Then we can see the sailors have a go at trying to um, save Jonah, save themselves and Jonah. But God intensifies the storm so that they can't. They can't rescue Jonah. So God calls Jonah, God sends the storm, God intensifies the storm, and then God does rescue Jonah. And then we get to the psalm, which is verse, uh, chapter 2, and in that psalm, Jonah worships God, and uh, God is the object of, of Jonah's praise and thanksgiving. 
So this is a little bit different. We're going to learn a lot about God as God teaches us things through the life of Jonah and what happens around there. So let's get to the the text, and it starts with the word of the Lord came to Jonah. God is going to show us he is the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer of all in this passage. And if we watch closely, you will see God is caring and has compassion for all men and women, not just in Israel, not just in the villages around Israel, but even in the big cities like Bradford. That's an exciting, dynamic message. God cares for all men and women and the plants. There's even, we'll see tonight, chapter 3, chapter 4, there's even uh, compassion for a plant. And animals. There are references as we go through to animals under the control of God. Cattle. God doesn't just care for the 120,000 or more in Nineveh, but also the cattle. It's mentioned there. And the fish. And we can see God in control and caring, having compassion for men and women and plants and animals. And there's this summary verse, um, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. So this is the God we worship, God who is God of creation, the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer of all. And unlike other passages which begin on prophecy, this one starts with the word of the Lord, which reminds people of Jeremiah. The, the words um, in the prophet of Jeremiah here, the book of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So we have the word of the Lord, and if we stop there, go slowly enough to notice that it's unusual. Um, We would, as Christians living after Easter, this side of Easter, we would want to say, well, what do Christians understand by the word of the Lord? And we have an answer in John, the beginning of John, the Gospel of John. So allow yourself to accept that this is teaching direct from God to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And we can learn from Christ, we can learn from the cross of Easter, we, can, we should expect to see, as we go through, ideas about grace and ideas about salvation, if this is the word of the Lord coming to speak to Jonah. Then we go on to go up, or go to the city, the great city of Nineveh. Well, hang on a minute, what's this great city? This is one of the cruelest, possibly the cruelest city on the earth. Read the prophet Nahum. It's horrendous what these people get up to and what they're like. So we need to to realize that this is um, a, a bad place full of bad people in Jonah's mind. So go up to this city, preach against it. Okay, well, that's good. We understand that because of how evil they are. Because of this wickedness has come up before me. So what is Jonah thinking now when this has happened, this call? He's thinking probably, I don't want to do this because Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. They were evil and they were destroyed. And the, word, the, 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 the message of complaint about them was, was heard in heaven and they were destroyed. And there was no prophet that went to Sodom and Gomorrah to warn them. Jonah knows God. He is upset. We'll learn about that in chapter 3 later on. He's upset because if God is sending him as a messenger to preach against them, this is because God is a compassionate God and they're going to be given a second chance. So he's not happy. What happens next? Jonah ran away. So instead of going up, he goes down. Jonah ran away from the Lord, headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God, small g. Now, you need to understand another part of the teaching here is 
the Easter message, if you like, trust in Jesus, trust in the Lord for salvation. Because there are other things you can trust in. There are other gods, there are other idols, there's other ways of living. We can trust in our career. Uh, we can trust in uh, the future to be exactly as it is now. When I joined uh, our organization uh, to go off to Indonesia, that meant leaving Roundtrees. And absolutely everybody said, you shouldn't be doing that because it's not sensible. Roundtrees is going to be stable and it's going to be here forever and it's a fantastic pension scheme. You've got to be very, very sure of what you're doing. My father, my wife's father, my father-in-law, my uncle Dennis, who worked for Nestle, bless him, all these people ganged up and said, don't be silly, you've got twin daughters now, get someone else to go out to be uh, a missionary. And what happened after we got to Bible College, within about two years or so, Nestle took over Brown Trees. And if you go to York now and, and look around, um, most of the jobs have gone from York to uh, Croydon or uh, out to Switzerland. And the recipes changed. I would quickly tell you that if you're interested. So don't be surprised that Kit Kats don't taste as good as they used to. So be careful. There are other gods. And these sailors are crying out to their other gods. And does the storm stop? No, it doesn't. So that's just go slow enough to realize that they're calling out to God, but it's got a small g and it's not working. So what do they do? They throw out the cargo. So that's really bad news. Now they're in economic trouble as well as um, actual physical danger. They're still not safe. What happens after that? Maybe not everybody is praying to their gods. So they go down and they find someone asleep and the captain goes to him and says, how can you sleep? Get up, call on your God, small g. Maybe he will take notice of us and maybe we will not perish. They don't, it's not working. So they try casting lots. And we know in Proverbs... God is in control. Big theme of Jonah. God is in control. You can try casting lots. God is in control of the outcome. So they, tr they cast lots to find out what's happened. And surprise, surprise, the lot falls on Jonah. So they go to Jonah and say, come on, tell us what's going on. Who is responsible for making all this trouble? What do you do? What's your career? Where do you come from? What is your country? Who are you? What tribe are you from? And he replies in a very ironic way, I'm a Hebrew, I worship the Lord. He's not really worshipping brilliantly, is he, when you think about it. I worship the Lord. He's supposed to be somewhere else doing what the Lord said. And he's asleep in the bottom of the boat. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land, which is a point really here. We need God with a capital G. And this is the, the disobedient servant of that God. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? And I don't know, but maybe your mother has this question as well. We've come to it. What have you done? Or what have you done? Or what have you done? You know, put the emphasis wherever you like. They knew. Jonah had been teaching them already some stuff because they knew that he was running away from the Lord He'd said that. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they said to him, okay, so we understand you're the problem. Tell us what to do. How can we make the calm? Because your God is in charge of all of this. This is the problem, so what do we do? And he says, pick me up, throw me into the sea, and everything will be fine. So they won't do that. Um, so they try and row to land, verse 13. But God lets the sea get worse, so that doesn't work. The sea becomes wilder than before. So they cry to the Lord. This is interesting. Now they're not calling on their God's small g. Now they're calling on the Lord, capital L. O oh Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. This is an echo of Easter here. Allow yourself to, to see that. 
So they take Jonah, they throw him overboard, and the raging sea grows calm. At this, their fear increases. They greatly feared the Lord now, and they offer a sacrifice, which is a biblical way of saying they knew what they were doing. They seem to be genuinely um, following the Lord and made vows to him, verse 16. The Lord now saves Jonah, provides a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah is now inside the fish for three days and three nights. And we move into the psalm. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed. And it's very poetic, very beautiful, but also very colorful. Sort of David Attenborough journey into the depths of the ocean. In his distress, I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me from the depths of the grave. I called for help, and you listened. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled all around me, the waves and the breakers, they swept over me, and I was banished from your sight. I will look on your holy temple. Now, again, echoes of Easter. What happened in Easter? We had the, the in the temple, what happened there with the the curtain being torn in two and the access to God through the sun. The, the temple is very important in this story of salvation. It's no longer a, a magical mystery. Now we have um, access to God through what Christ did on the cross. We're in the gulf, engulfed in the, in the waters. The deep has surrounded Jonah. Seaweed has wrapped around him. To the roots of the mountains, he goes down. You can imagine what it's like in the depths of the ocean. Down and the earth beneath has barred me forever. But you brought me up. So my life has come up, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Then you have this amazing verse. To those who cling to worthless idols, for these people forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. So Jonah is getting us to stop and realize that there's different ways of living um, and running away from the call, if you like, as he has done. And perhaps they will be following idols, if you like, such as the sailors were doing. But it's not just a waste of time. It's not just a waste of resources or a waste of your energy or a waste of your experience. It's a waste of grace that could have been yours. It's, a, it's an interesting extra line of, um, of thinking. It's not just that this particular course of action, which isn't in the line of God's will, is a waste of your life, but it's also a waste of the grace that could be yours. If you move on from that, you get to the final verses, but I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will make good. He's looking forward to his being rescued, and he says, salvation comes from the Lord. It's, it's a, a, an interesting summary to finish on. Salvation comes from the Lord. The final thought of that psalm. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto dry land. So he is rescued by the Lord. Tonight, we can go on and look into what happens next. Because as a recruitment psychologist, having worked in round trees and so on, if we had someone as bad as this, um, I don't think they get a second chance. That's why you have periods of probation. Uh, you, you, you want to see how, how it goes. And going as badly as this, um, perhaps that's the end of it. But not so in this book. What happens next is, we'll see tonight, the word of the Lord comes again for a second time to Jonah, and the response is different. What you will see again is, is that there is an extraordinary response in Nineveh, which is amazing. So an ex some have said this is, this is the best evangelist, this, this example here, the most effective evangelist in the Bible. Even the people who he's not supposed to be going to become believers in the Lord. 
which reminds us perhaps of the missionaries who got sent to China, and as they were traveling to China, people on the ships were converted. So they felt called by God to the Chinese back in the 1800s, and the early stories talk of, of people coming to the Lord even on the journey to, to serve the Chinese. As the story goes on, we will also see that there is a message here about selfishness, because a plant comes, and we'll see that, and there's caring for the plant, but not caring in the heart of Jonah for the people. So the question comes, how have you got like this? How come you're so selfish? The people that God cares about are everybody. The, the, the creation that God cares about is everybody. It is for all nations. It's all very, very interesting and very dynamic and very exciting. Because the, the point of the story is not watch Jonah and look and see how he learns that God is in control and watch Jonah look and watch and see how he learns that God has got compassion for the whole uh, of the nations. Or look and see how the reluctant Jonah um, can be persuaded to become a reluctant evangelist. That's not the message. The message is for us, that we have in this world to make a choice between gods with a small g and grace. That we can choose, and very easily choose, to follow the, the devices and desires of our own hearts, as, as the liturgy has it. Very easily we can go down and go to sleep, as Jonah did, rather than go up to do as w w whatever we've been called to do. If we will be faithful, and if we will witness, as Jonah discovered, uh, blessings will follow. We are called to be faithful, alive believers this side of Easter, introducing people to Christ and expecting great things from that. We are not called to follow our own idols and to make up our own story and to be selfish. The book of Jonah has these very clear examples as God patiently teaches us through the life of Jonah, that simple lesson. Salvation comes from the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is available to us. And we thank you, by your word, we can learn more of your will. Help us to be obedient to that and to walk in your will. For Jesus' name's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen.